We've been trying to figure out how to coexist with other creatures that don't precisely share our belief systems for 400 million years. You know, and we've been sufficiently successful about it so that we're both social, and here we are. So obviously, there's ways that it can be dealt with, although I don't think we necessarily understand them very well. And part of... So, I didn't want to just understand what it was about belief systems, you know, about their necessity and their function, and the way that they become pathologized. I wanted to figure out if there was also a pattern to the processes by which belief systems are modified and negotiated so that belief systems that have different structures can coexist in the same place peacefully. That's a vital question, right? Because most of you are going to get married, successfully or unsuccessfully. And even if you don't, you're going to live with someone for a long period of time and you're going to find out that they're not like you. And that's extremely annoying. But, you know, what are you going to do? You're either going to be a slave, or a tyrant, or you're going to negotiate, because those are your options. And negotiation is extraordinarily difficult, right, because you have to figure out what you want and probably you won't even admit it. And second of all, you have to listen to your stupid partner telling you what they want, and then you have to try to figure out how you're going to make both of them possible. Well, slavery, tyranny, that's comparatively easy from a cognitive perspective compared to actually trying to figure out how you can be mutually satisfied in the same space. But you can do it. That's the thing. There is a process and it's identifiable. So I want to talk to you about belief systems and their psychological significance. What they're like, what function they perform, but I also want to talk to you about how they transform because they do, right? They change, especially with humans. So they can change, that means they can modify. And that means, at least in principle, that we could have a dialogue. Now, dialogues, that's rough, but the alternative is, right? And that's partly why you're supposed to listen to your enemy. Because if you don't listen to your enemy, the only other thing you can do is fight with them. That's it. Well, well, I had to learn to, I would say, engage in conflict especially when it conflicts with compassion. Um, I've been in a lot of conflict, the, and I don't find it pleasant, and I don't like upsetting people at all. It really bothers me. And, uh, but I did learn that conflict avoided is conflict delayed and magnified. And so it was a cross-temperamental learning process for me. I had to learn to work against my temperament in order to engage in conflict that was necessary when it was necessary. And so that conflict probably perhaps came more naturally to your mother or with less internal opposition. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it bothered me as much, but we always worked through our problems until we had resolution. And you were very, uh, obs you were very persistent in making sure that we found our resolution. And I don't know exactly what that was about, if it had anything to do with our, your personality. Um, well, I think partly, weirdly enough, it was a consequence of my dislike of conflict. I thought, oh my God, we have a problem here. It's an actual problem. It's going to happen every day or every week or every month for the rest of our bloody lives. Let's hash it out right now, despite the fact mm -hmm. that that will make me sweat and raise my blood pressure and exhaust me. Because if we could actually negotiate our way through it and come to a solution, we wouldn't have to have a fight anymore. Yeah, and so, that worked. We went through our problems, and we still continue to go through our problems. We don't rehash stuff all the time. No. Well, we made rules, too. Like, when we were talking about an issue, it might have been something as trivial as who was going to clean up the bathroom sink and how quickly after they used it. Part of the rule was we focus on the specific issue so you don't get to say, well, you never cleaned up the sink, and you're right. always leaving things around, and you've done this your whole life, and you'll never change is a really bad negotiating strategy. It was like, okay, apparently we have a problem with the sink. That might have been because of our differences in orderliness, which we'll get together. It's like, what is it that you want specifically done about this specific thing? And then we would negotiate back and forth until both of us were satisfied. And we used to have meetings with you kids once a week. We'd sort out the week's responsibilities at this meeting. And the meeting had rules, which was, well, there's some jobs that need to be done and everybody has to play a role in doing them so that nobody gets resentful and bitter. And you have to attend the meeting, although you can leave if you get upset, but you have to come back and you have to abide by what you say 
what you agreed to. And so don't week. need to... For the week. So it wasn't, a, week. it wasn't a big ask, right? Seven days. But that's a long time for a kid. It is a long time. Yeah, well, and, and people generally don't have meetings of that sort. And one of the rules was, and this has been a rule that Tammy and I have used in our whole relationship, is like, do not agree to something you don't agree to. Because the worst thing is, is you negotiate out a settlement and the person decides they're going to implement it, but really they're resentful about it because they didn't want to have any conflict. And then mm. they're crabby about it every time they do it and they do a terrible job and they're irritated about it and that lasts forever. So none of that. So that's a good rules. Do not agree to things you do not agree with. And if you're agreeable, you'll say yes and then you'll get resentful. And that's the bitter and horrible underside of empathy. We also learned in our relationship often to discuss things and then let both parties sleep on it. And if you go to sleep with the intent of further clarifying the negotiation, then you often wake up in the morning with something to say, you know, that might also cause further conflict, but is part of the means by which you reach a peaceful negotiated settlement. I mean, Tammy, you remember when we were first together, We'd have a conflict about some deep thing, usually. For about three days. Yeah, and then... Once a week. Well, and then, yeah, yeah. No, for a year. <laughs> yeah, more than that even, probably. No, that was for the first yeah, year. Yeah, well, often, I'd be trying to work through this, and it would, it would be at night, and Tammy would say, I have to go to sleep now, which drove me crazy. I'd be up, like, per persisting on the internal discussion. She'd be sound asleep beside me, which is extremely annoying. <laughs> but she would very frequently wake up in the morning with something to say that was helpful or with a dream that related to well, the... Well, those kind of pauses that you take when you sleep, allow it allowed me to reflect and find out what I may have brought to the situation. And that always helped. Yeah, well, that was another thing we did mm. constantly too, which was to try to figure out how, you know, I would sit on the end of my bed, and Tammy did this as well, when we were having a fight and think, okay, what stupid thing did I do at some point in the, in the lead up to this discussion that increased the probability that this would be unpleasantly conflictual and that's interfering with the solution? And man, if you ask yourself that question, you'll get an answer. And then you can offer that answer to the person. You can say, look, despite the fact that you're utterly wrong and that this is horrible and you should just listen to me, because that's what you like to think, you could say, well, here I figured out something I did that was not optimal or maybe outright wrong and it's complicating it. And so like, sorry about that. And you have to mean that. And if you have any sense, you do. And then we could progress. Yeah, that was a great strategy because I think it, uh, not only deals with the situation at hand, but it deals with uh, behavioral patterns that you've had since childhood that sometimes don't work anymore. And in the in the conflict, you can see the discord and you wonder what you may have brought to it. So then that can shed some light on past um, behaviors and yeah. then you can update them. 